So I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. So I'm gonna give you the full story. I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, where you know gun ownership is taboo. You know, in, in the inner city, the problem is is that people have guns and people die, which is legit. That's just the way of life growing up in the inner city. And so the politicians and the media feed this narrative of, oh my gosh, guns are evil, so nobody can have them. The truth of the matter is, is that if law abiding citizens had the ability to possess firearms with minimal, restric min minimal restrictions, no restrictions, what you would see is the criminal element would understand, you know what, I can't act crazy because I'm not sure who's carrying. The vast majority of people just want to live in harmony and peace with one another. They're not trying to cause problems. But when the criminal element understands that the politicians restrict gun ownership to the degree where normal people feel it's taboo and it's the wrong thing to do, it actually empowers the criminal element. It's it's kind of sad because that's, I just feel like common sense, obvious. I've heard it a million times throughout my life that an unarmed society is a polite society. If people in the cities were armed, then criminals would be scared of them because you have equal force to be used against you. But it, it doesn't seem to get through to these gun control advocates. And now we have Joe Biden coming out with the, what, what, what was his slogan? Let's uh, let's get the job done, or was it? Finish the, job. Finish the job. I don't really know what he was talking about. He was yelling too much for me. He was. He was slurring yeah. a bit, too. But he said, he let's that. finish the job, ban assault weapons. Right. And they can't even define what it is. So this goes back to what I was just asking uh, Congresswoman Boebert. Right. How do you affect change in a positive direction with, with, with through logical lens to make things better if your political opponents don't know what they're talking about? Well, the first part is, you know, I always go back to Gladiator. I'm going to date myself a little bit. You know, I'm, I'm 44. That movie with Russell, what was you it? Listen, Gladiator was that movie. That was a good movie. It was, that was that movie. <laughs> and, you know, the advice. Yeah, Phoenix. The advice to, um, you know, to Russell Crowe, Maximus, in the movie was, you win the crowd, you win your freedom. And so on a, on a philosophical level, pol politics hasn't really changed. Politics, the art of politics is really about can you get enough people in the body populace, in the, in the population to be with you? If you can get enough of them to be with you, then you can then you have the political will to move the argument, to move the bill, to move the policy. But it, if you never get the people to see your side and be on your side, you can't win your freedom. That's the way you can actually, in some respects, break Washington loose because for a long time, you know, as a conservative, the media is against you. You know that Republicans largely have been terrible at messaging. We know that. So it ends up becoming people deciding to engage in politics and policy of their own volition, of their own passions. And the nut, I think that, you know, I guess the new the new age, myself, Bo Burt and others, Gates and others that we're trying to crack is. Is there the possibility to get your average American to look at our arguments and be like, you know what? That Byron dude is right. I like what he's saying. I think, And, the and that's the pathway. I think the internet helped greatly. Big time. But I also think there's, a, there's an inverse reaction too because you end up with these people. Uh, one, one of the examples of social media manipulation I've brought up is that uh, imagine you're 10 years old in 2008. Right. Facebook is just coming into, you know, popularity and prominence, or it's getting bigger and bigger. And these companies like BuzzFeed and Huffington Post find out that, you know what kind of article gets the most traffic? Mm -hmm. Police brutality. 100%. So they start making more and more and more of it. Right. Now you're a little kid and you're on Facebook and the only thing you see every single day is more and more videos of police brutality. Right. Rap songs about it. I don't know if you've, ever, you've seen that rap song, This Is What Happens When You Call The Cops. I mean, I'm a hip hop kid, so I even go back to NWA, Ice Cube, Snoop. You know, that's how far I go back. Yeah. I'm a hip hop kid. I love hip hop. So, so. you're 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 a little kid and right. you're seeing this nothing but this for 10 years. Right. 10 years later, you're 18. You're ready to vote. Your whole world is shaped around this idea that police are going around mercilessly murdering people and targeting black people. Yeah. And it's just an extreme, insane exaggeration built by social media manipulation. So as much as the Internet empowered the ability of conservatives who tended to have a bad mess, bad messaging or were locked out from the media, you end up with people who are living in a deranged state, like Trump derangement syndrome from this stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you reach these people? And I mean, how do you, it feels like the country's bifurcated the point where, to, to put it another way, you've got the West Coast wanted to ban gas vehicles. 
You've got some states banning child sex change operations, some states becoming sanctuaries for child sex change operations. I don't see how you pull that stuff together. How do you, how do you bring these cultures back together? I mean, look, it's very difficult, but that's where programs like yours come in. <clears throat> you know, I mean, Bobert was like, hey, Byron, you got to come in and do this podcast tonight. I said, you know, whose podcast <laughs> are we doing? She's like, I'm going to tell you about them. It's great. I said, all right, cool. I'm in. I'm going to do it. Cool. You have to do programming like this. I think that the way that our party has done messaging is you deal with the Washington Post, the New York Times, MSNBC, NBC, CBS, ABC. They hate your guts. You know you're going to get a hard interview. When Fox came along 30 years ago, Fox was like a revelation for, for the conservative movement and for the Republican Party. Just being honest, it was a revelation, right? Yeah. But because young people take in information on this thing at warp speed, because I got three kids, they you look at their phones, they don't even watch TV anymore. So I try to tell my colleagues, I'm like, guys, don't get me wrong, doing interviews is cool, but there's a whole nother uh, ecosystem you have to penetrate. How do you do it? Do you do it through reels? Do you do it with shorts? Do you do it with responses to some narrative out of media? And it's not just doing it once. It's not just saying, oh, I went on, and this is no disrespect to Sean Hannity, love the dude, good dude, but it's not just doing a Hannity primetime hit. It's are you in a rapid fire response, pushing narratives, pushing messages, what's actually happening, being able to explain the thing in 90 seconds. Like, you you don't have 20 minutes. And don't get me wrong, like, look, I'm about as eloquent as they come. People love listening to me. I don't got 20 minutes. I got 90 <laughs> seconds to get this thing right. But think about even in Congress, uh, you had, what, five minutes to question Twitter? Right. How do, you, how do you get through a deep conversation to break down the issues that are negatively impacting this country if they're like, your five minutes begins now, good luck? Well, that's why I try to change the rules. So what I've been talk talking to the chairman and to the speaker was, we got to get out of this mindset of every member's recognized for five minutes. That's ridiculous. By the time you get warmed up, the time is over. And then the other thing is a lot of members waste time because they're trying to fill their time. And then the third piece is staff members write most of the questions and most of these speeches. So you'll see the member like this and they'll be reading their thing like this. And they'll never look at the person sitting in the chair. Their eyes are down because they're reading it. You don't have an opportunity to engage in a legitimate dialogue on the issues presented. So my my position has always been, look, get rid of seniority recognition, <clears throat> get rid of the five minutes, have the chairman recognize members as they choose to be recognized. What you would have is a dialogue between members, a dialogue with the witnesses. Then you can get into a situation like that. Oh, I don't have my five minutes. I got one question. I threw out a question. Ocasio Cortez does whatever she does on the other side. I look at it like, oh, that's a bunch of BS. Chairman, let me in. <laughs> I come back, fire back. That's how you get the dialogue moving. That's what Congress doesn't do. Right. Because Congress is fixated on doing your clip for a newsreel that might show up in one of the network news shows at night. Or maybe the New York Times might report on it or the Philadelphia Inquirer or whatever, or the L.A. Times. We're in a different uh, genre in media. And so you got to have that conflict in a positive way to get the message out to people to see what's really happening. What do you think about the, the squad? How, how, how is your relationship with them? So I talked to some of them on the side. You know, I just keep it professional. Um, again, I grew up in the inner city. So for me. It's never personal until you mess with like my personal safety or my family or my money. You do that, now it's personal. Everything else is business. Is that why in Congress? Because people are getting like basically bribed by right. you know pharmaceutical companies, they're, they're whoever they're right. they're what do they call them lobbyists yeah, yeah. that they actually feel like you're threatening their money if you're passing a bill that denies no, their no, lobbyists. No, 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 no. That's that's not even it. Because the truth is about lobbyists is they're going to write you a check regardless. What a lobbyist really wants is access. They want to be able to be like, look, if I pass you a $5,000 check, if I call your staff or if I, if I happen to have your cell phone, will you answer my call and give me an opportunity to explain myself? Lobbyists are counting votes, which also is what leadership in both chambers is doing. They're counting votes. That's all they're doing. I tell people at home all the time, look, if you call my office, just you by yourself, I'm not even going to like, I don't even know that you called. If 100 people called my office, 
my chief of staff knows and she's like, hey, Byron, uh, we had 100 calls on this issue. If a thousand people call, my whole office knows what's going on. And I definitely know what's going on. That's how this works. The lobbyists, all they're doing is trying to have an ability to have a conversation with the member. If you have members who change their opinions just because of what a lobbyist says, you got a weak member. That person probably needs to go home and not be an elected official. Real talk, right? But the issue is not just the lobbyist per se. When I talk about being able to talk with members on the other side, squad members, me and Jamal Bowman, we talk football. We don't even talk politics. We know we don't agree on politics. <clears throat> so we're talking about the NFL. We talk football. And because we talk football, we have a, an ability to engage each other if there's something popping up where a conversation needs to be had. Um, with the squad members, for everybody who says, oh, Freedom Caucus members are always causing problems in Republican leadership, squad members cause problems in Democrat leadership. They do the same thing on the other side, but, but our politics are so different. That's why people they, think we're always at odds with them. They seem to be marching more in lockstep with the rest of the party these days, though, especially well, when it comes to war. I would argue that what they've done on their side is they've gotten their party to march in lockstep with them. Thanks for watching this clip from the Timcast IRL podcast. Hang out with us live Monday through Friday at 8 p.m. And become a member over at TimCast.com for uncensored members-only shows exclusive. Thanks for hanging out, and we'll see you all next time.